Welcome to the Maranatha Bible Class with Bible Teacher Bob Sirignano. continue in the book of Ephesians, the first chapter. I've been there for a while and I want to pick up and I want to touch on a few things where I felt I had to rush through the last class and I just want to emphasize some things to you that I believe will be a blessing to you. Okay, so if you would turn, if you have your Bibles or you can look at the screen, I'm in Ephesians chapter 1. And I just want to read on the screen here just verse 10, and then I'm going to jump to something else. And this is what the Apostle Paul said here. He was talking about the dispensation of the fullness of times. This is very, very important. This is just not idle words. This has a specific meaning. And I want you to kind of understand what I'm going to be talking about here in just a second he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. All right, now I want to jump. I want you to understand the dispensation that the Apostle Paul was talking about is that in Scripture, when we study from Revelation, I'm, I'm sorry, from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Revelation chapter 22, you will find dispensations in the Word of God. On the screen are the, dis, the different dispensations. You have the first one would be innocence. And you find that in Genesis chapter 2 through 3. This is the time when man was created on the earth. And it was God's desire to come down and visit man and walk with man and have fellowship with man in the cool of the day. It was always God's intention to do that. There's coming a time where everything will revert back to that time. Okay? The second uh, dispensation is conscience. Third is government. Fourth is promise. Fifth is law. And then the sixth is the dispensation of the church age, which is what we are in right now. But now the church age is coming to its conclusion. Okay, and the church age will be done away with when the next dispensation comes into, into play. Okay? But the church age will not be completely over until the time of Jacob's trouble actually starts. And this is specifically designed for the nation and the tribes of Israel will be the time of Jacob's trouble, or you might better well know it as the great tribulation period that even Jesus spoke about, okay? And he warned that was coming upon the earth. So we have the church age that's about to close, that we have the great tribulation period, and then after the great tribulation period, we will have the second coming of the Lord. He will come back to this earth, destroy the Antichrist, the false prophet. Satan will be, will be caught, and all three of those will be disposed of. The false prophet and the Antichrist will go to the lake of fire for all eternity. Satan will be bound in a bottomless pit for nearly a thousand years. Okay? The last dispensation is the millennial reign. 
on this earth. And you notice there's seven up there. So somebody tell me, other than you, Brother Steve, what does the number seven mean in the Bible? Completion, Completion perfect, per being perfect, right? Uh, God always has a plan, and you see it in these dispensations. Now, we're not going to talk a great deal about this, but I do want to talk about in Titus chapter 2, starting with verse 11 through 14, this is one of the, to me, one of Paul's greatest writings is, is these, these, these couple of verses. And it teaches us a lot if we take the time and slow down and look at this. So I want to go over these verses, and it ties into Ephesians, okay? So, in Titus chapter 2, this is what the Apostle Paul says. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to Israel. Is that what it says? That doesn't say that. Some men. Doesn't say, it says all men. All men. This goes along with what other scripture in the word of God? That it's not God's will that any should perish, but that everyone would come to salvation, right? This is God's plan. This has always been his plan. Not that certain groups of people are not fit to go into the kingdom of God. But it's God's plan. And it's through His grace. It's through His mercy. It's through His righteousness that all these things would come to pass. So, the grace of God that brings salvation. And the salvation is God's plan of salvation. It's not a man-made plan of salvation. It's not something that men can come up with and decide this is how you get saved. It's God's plan. It's only through God. It comes only through Him, right? And it, we know that it comes through Jesus, okay? Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Now, I want you to, to hear what I'm saying this morning, okay? This is very important. That God's plan, His grace, His plan of salvation is teaching us, okay? That denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live, what? Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That's absolutely essential that everyone that has accepted Jesus as their personal Savior walks away from worldly lusts and the desires that the world is trying to entice us with and trying to get our attention, try to get our eyes on these things. And it's a variety of, of many, many different things, okay? But God's plan of salvation, His grace is teaching us that we need to get away from those things, and they might look good for a while. They might appear to the flesh for a while. They might even satisfy someone for a while, but ultimately it leads to an individual's destruction and eternal destruction if a person stays there, okay? So, there's an old saying, if you listen to old preachers from years and years ago, they would talk to you, you need to be holy, you need to be righteous, you need to, you need to live a godly life. We don't necessarily hear that as much anymore. We hear things... Exactly, that's exactly right. But we hear things, you can live your best life. God wants you to have everything that this world has to offer. This is spiritual cyanide. It leads you in the wrong direction. It's a lie. We should always be seeking God, what is your will for my life? And God's will for, for our lives is what Scripture says. Not what comes out of the, the mouth of a famous preacher that's on TV, but it comes from the Word of God. And this is what we have, we must absolutely Put all our trust in God's Word. Yes. That's absolutely the standard. That's the roadmap. That's what we need to be using to guide our lives. Now, we can find godly individuals that can teach and preach the Word of God and help us and help build our faith up. But ultimately, 
Our trust needs to be in God's Word. Amen? Amen. Everybody agree? Amen. That's even above and beyond anything that I would say. you got to check me out in the Word of God. And, and, and find that if I'm saying something that doesn't line up with this book, you need to cast it aside and you need to call me into question. Amen? All right. I think that was kind of weak. All right. Verse 13. Okay. This is what the Apostle Paul says. Looking for the blessed hope. Who can tell me what the blessed hope is? Rapture. What? Rapture. Who said rapture? Amen. That's exactly right. That's what he's talking about. The Apostle Paul was the one who God gave this revelation to. All the prophets of old knew that there were certain things that were going to take place in the last of the last days. The Holy Spirit gave them insight and they wrote things for the people that would live beyond them. But they didn't see everything. God gave them glimpses. It's kind of like the, the picture I showed a long time ago when the prophets would see things. They would see mountain peaks of events. But they didn't see everything in the valley. They didn't see all the details. But for us, the mountain peaks of prophecy is enough to give us, and there's enough of those peaks from all of the Old Testament prophets and from all of the New Testament that we get a good picture and enough as a standard that we should live our lives and what we need to trust in. So the blessed hope is the rapture of the church. Now the church is not this building. It, it represents Brother Bob, Brother Wayne, Brother Bob, Sister Julia. It represents everybody in this room. Every color, every race, people from every nation. It's made up of all different kinds of tongues. And now if I really had the time, I would go into Abraham's, uh, the promise that God gave to Abraham. And I'll just say it this way. So when God told Abraham to look out over the land, he was referring to the land that was going to be promised to Israel, okay? But he said that Abraham's seed would be like the sand of the sea, which no man could number. And if anyone in here thinks that they can go count sand in the sea, please raise your hand. I'm going to turn the camera on you. Are you, Bob? You can got, do it? You've got all eternity to do it. You've got all eternity to do it. Yeah, it probably would take all eternity to do it. But what the promise is, Jacob... His 12 sons, all the seed of Israel and that make up the Jewish nation, they would come into that, that sand of the sea. And then it would be all of the other individuals that would make up the church through accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And that, that means people from all tribes, nations, and tongues. So when you read in the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, when all the nations of the earth will come up, to see Jesus ruling and reigning on the, king, uh, on, on the throne in Jerusalem. And they will bow down and they will worship him. This is going to make up all of the church. This is going to make up of all the people that have accepted him as king of king and lord of, life, lord of lords. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. That's going to be a beautiful, beautiful time. And I don't believe it's that far in the, in the future. I, I believe it's really close. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So here's a verse that you can mark in your Bible. So when those visitors come to your house and they want to tell you about the true Jesus, okay, and he's at the kingdom hall, this is a verse here that proves the deity of Jesus Christ. That he's fully God and fully man at the same time, and that he is the Savior of the world. Okay? So if you haven't already marked your Bible with that verse, I would suggest that you do. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify, or we could actually say sanctify, for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. So Christians, my brothers and sisters, 
If you're not zealous for good works that please God, you need to really be praying about that. As a child of God, we need to be zealous. It needs to be burning deep in our heart that I want to do everything I can to please the Lord. Nothing else matters. Getting all the riches and all, all the material possessions of this world means nothing. And it will not last for eternity. But what lasts for eternity is what you do for Christ now. And whatever that is, we all have different callings. Sister, you have a beautiful calling of playing the chauffeur. That is a gift. I can play the one horn, but I can't do two. And that, that comes, that's a gift that comes directly from God. We all have gifts. Some of us have gifts where we can go down and pray with someone at the altar and lead them uh, to, to the Lord or to pray, help them pray through or whatever it may be. We all have gifts and we need to be zealous at this time right now to be using those gifts to glorify God. Nothing else matters because if we drove home today and we died in a car wreck, all what matters is what we're doing for the Lord and that our heart's right with God. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. All right. Or an oh me, you're wrong. <laughs> All right. All right, so let's move on. In Ephesians chapter uh, 1, verse 13. So in him, speaking of Jesus, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom you also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. Now I want you to drop your name into that verse. Okay? And just, just be with me because Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus here. But when he says in, uh, in him you put your name there because you've already done these things. You have, you've knelt at the foot of the cross, you accepted Jesus, you trusted Him, right? Because you heard the word of salvation, you heard the gospel, you have repented. So this is speaking now to you, okay? So you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So now I want to tell, tell you something, I, I hope this really sinks in. So Satan is the great counterfeiter. He's the liar. Right? He tries to counterfeit the things of God for the sole reason of deception, to lead people astray, to get them off, to get them off the straight and narrow path, to get them onto the broad road that leads to destruction. Okay? So the scripture says here, okay, that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. This has a twofold meaning, okay? You have the Holy Spirit come into your life once you accept Christ. So that when you go and try to do something that you did in the past that would be sinful, you're immediately convicted before you do it. Does anybody disagree with that? Okay. So if you stole in the past and now you walk in to a store and you want to steal a piece of candy, you'll be immediately convicted as soon as that thought enters your mind. Don't go steal the candy. It's wrong. Where before, you didn't have that. So that's one part of the ceiling. Okay? Now, here's the other part. When, when you are sealed by God, God marks you. And I'm going to prove it from the Word of God. Okay? So Satan tries to counterfeit this. Okay? And we know from the book of Revelation, his ultimate counterfeit will be the mark of the beast. But God has his own mark. Okay, now I want to show you from Scripture. i got to put my glasses back on. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, this is what Scripture says. Now this is when a mighty angel comes down from heaven, and there's four other angels ready to pour out God's wrath upon this world at that time. Okay, this is in the future. And the mighty angel tells the other four angels, don't do anything until the servants of God. This is referring to the 144,000 Jewish evangelists that God is going to call out of every single tribe of Israel. 
and they are going to go forth and preach the gospel. But God does something very special here. He puts a seal on their forehead. Okay? He puts a seal on there. So what's that purpose? What's the purpose of that? Now we're going to go to where you have to think a little bit beyond the natural. So we see, I can see Brother Bob right here in front of me. Okay? Now if I go outside and there is an angel that's over this church, I won't be able to see that with my physical eyes unless God opens my eyes. So when you have time, read 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 17 through 20, and you'll see a good illustration of that. When Elisha seen the armies of God that surrounded the Syrian army, the servant that was with Elisha could not see it, right? And he, all he could see with the physical was the Syrian army. But Elisha can see, in the supernatural, can see things beyond the flesh. Does that make sense to everybody? And then Elisha prayed to God, open up his eyes so he can see. And once he's seen, he's seen all the army, these angels, with flaming swords and, and fire, chariots of fire, ready to go to battle in on Elisha's behalf. Okay? So that's what I'm talking about. We see things in the flesh and the natural, but there are things in the another realm that we don't actually see, but they're here and they're, they're real. When God marks the 144,000, it's going to have God's name right across their forehead. And the fallen angels, the demons, can't touch them because they're God's property. So I want you to think. God does it there. He also does it in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. I'm going to read this. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go and come out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven uh, from my God. And I will write on him uh, my new name. All right. So here, when you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, I believe from Scripture, and there's actually more Scripture, I believe you're sealed and you have the name of Jesus or Yeshua on your forehead. You belong to him. Okay? Doesn't mean that the enemy can't come and flash bad thoughts yes. to your mind when you open up your mind to that. Doesn't mean you're not going to have fiery darts come out of you. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Okay? But you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, and I believe you have the name of the Lord. We can't see it. Okay? And when we get in the presence of the Lord for all eternity, God's going to give us a new name, and that's going to go on our forehead. Maybe then we'll be able to see it. Okay? But here's what I want. Here, th this is the purpose of me telling you this, is you belong to the Lord. Don't ever forget that. You don't belong to the kingdoms of this world. You don't belong to the devil. I don't care what you have gone through in your life. If you trust in Christ, you're a what? A new creation, a new creature in Christ. All the past, everything that you did in your past, and all of us would have a testimony that we wouldn't want to brag about, right? We all would have sins that we would rather never to ever talk about again. But God wipes them all away. He totally cleans us. He purifies us. He sanctifies us. He makes us holy. It's not anything I can do other than kneeling down at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, here I am. Clean me up. I accept Jesus for what he did. I believe what the word of God says. And I pray now, Lord, that you would come into my heart, cleanse me, make me to, to, to be the person you would have me to be, and use me for your glory. And if you pray like Isaiah prayed, Lord, here I am. Use me. All right? And be a zealot for Christ. God hears that, and he will honor that. And he will mold you and shape you into the pers person to th that you need to be. So I would encourage you when you pray. I, I would really encourage you when you pray. 
to ask God, Lord, take me, mold me, take all the imperfections, anything that is not Christ-like, take it out of my life. I want to be, I want to be, when people see me, they say, there's something different about that person. And I want what that person has. Yes. Right? Yes. Amen. That's, that should be our desire. That should be our goal. And folks, don't ever think, yes. don't ever let the enemy tell you that because your physical body won't allow you to do certain things, because of your age, that you're washed up. Okay? If you got a voice, if you can wake up in the morning and your eyes open up, and you can struggle and walk to the bathroom. And if you could brush your teeth and you got a voice, you could still be used by the Lord. Amen? I think the Lord deserves a clap for that. Amen. Praise God. You're never washed up until you give your last breath. Give everything that you do for the glory of God. Amen. Yes. That's my prayer. Confirmation every every day. I say, God, whatever's in me that's not of you, clean it out. Take it out. And that should be the prayer of every single person in this room, every day, right? More so now that we see the day approaching, and we see more wickedness and ungodliness, and we see the direction of the world in the direction that it's going. Yes. All right, folks. We're not going to make this world better. I know there's a lot of churches and denominations out there that believe that we're going to make the world better and better. And then once we make it uh, the world a Christian world, then, then we can bring Jesus back. That it's not going to happen. That's not what Scripture says. You have to really manipulate and twist Scripture to believe that. Yes. And again, I'd go back to you and I'd tell you, be very careful who you listen to, yes. what you watch. Yep. Pray for godly discernment yes. and listen to what people say. Yes. And if they are wrong on that, my confidence level goes way down mm -hmm. to listen to that person. Because if they're wrong on that, what else are they going to be wrong on? Okay? Yes. All right. All right. Whew, where was I? Verse 14. <laughs> Who is the guarantee of our inheritance? So we all have an inheritance that comes as being a child of God yes. until the redemption of the purchased possession. Mm. You were purchased by the Lord. He gave his life. Mm. He hung on the cross. He was beaten, tortured, spit upon, mocked, ridiculed, rejected by his own people. Mm. But he died for you. Amen. And he purchased you. Yes. And according to Scripture, the purchase as in this, you were a slave to sin. Okay. You were in shackles. Yes. You belonged to the devil. Yes. And you were on the auction block. Mm -hmm. And Jesus came and purchased you back. Woo, Took the shackles hey. of sin off. Hey. You get off that auction block. Hey. You are no longer a slave to sin, but you are a child of God. Yes. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. This is something to get excited about. All right. I didn't even finish that, that verse. <laughs> to the praise of his glory. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, did not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So, folks, here, here's what I would like to say is... One of the what was Jesus' last command for the body of Christ? Well, well that wait in Jerusalem. What? Well, well that, but there was another thing that he love said. One love one another. I leave you with this one command that you love one another. What Jesus wanted was for us Christians to love each other, to have compassion to each other, to help each other, to minister to each other to mentor one another, to care for each other, and to pray for each other. So I ask you now, and this is not for you to raise your hand or actually answer this, but how much do you pray for your brothers and sisters? That's very, very important. That's what Scripture says. This is our roadmap. This is what we're going to use as our guidance. Then we need to use it. 
We need to pray for one another, right? When, when, when an individual comes to your mind, that's when you need to be praying for. Yes. Amen. Brother Steve? Keep in mind that we need to pray for our enemies too. Amen. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Good, good word. That's exactly right. And that, that's the difference between the church and the body of Christ. Our enemies will do everything they can to destroy us. Right? But we are to love them. Jesus said if someone slaps you on the right, let me demonstrate with Brother Bob. I'm just kidding. You want to turn the other cheek, right? Okay? That's because you sit right there, Bob. You're the easy one to pick on. All right. Under the spigot. Right. He's under the spigot, is right. Verse 17 that the God and our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. How many of you pray for those things? Yeah. Absolutely. Amen, sister. Pray for those things. Every single day in my own prayer time, I pray, God, give me godly wisdom. Give me knowledge and understanding and give me discernment in all things that pertain to my Christian walk. That I can serve you to the fullest that you would have me to serve you. Amen. Amen. So if you're not doing some of those things in your prayer life, now that you've heard it, you're going to be responsible for it. So today starts a day of deepening your prayer life. All right? Taking the next level. Okay? It's very, very, very important. All right. Verse 18. And I love this. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling that the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, when it speaks of the eyes there, it's figuratively speaking of an eyeball. But it's talking about your mind, that you will be enlightened in your mind, okay? It's very, very important. And this is one of the things that we need to be seeking as a child of God. We should always be growing, never retracting, never going backwards, but always growing in our faith. And it never stops. Now, maybe one day when we're actually in the presence of the Lord, that will stop because we'll have all knowledge at that time. I can't answer that. But I know until that day, we got to be striving forward. And we got to spend a lot of time on our knees, if we can get down on our knees, or if you're in a chair, praying in the chair. And we got to spend a lot more time in this book. This is God's word. This is better than a newspaper. This is better than any news show that you can watch. And this is better than any extra biblical book or secular book that you'll ever read. Yes. Is this right here? Yes, Brother Steve. The eyes are the gateway of the soul. That's exactly right. It's like That's a song, it. open the eyes of my heart. That's exactly right. So, folks, this is a challenge in Scripture for us to draw closer to the Lord. That's what the Apostle Paul is emphasizing here, is to grow in Christ. As I said before, run your race. Run with everything you've got. And don't let any hindrance ever get in your way. Don't let anything in this world be a stumbling block. And if you have stumbling blocks or roadblocks that are causing you not to have time to pray or to study God's Word, then you need to remove those roadblocks, yeah, yeah. those stumbling things. Yeah. That, that, that needs to go. There's always, always time to spend in God's Word. And some people say, well, I just don't have the time. And I'll, I'll ask them, I said, well, let, listen, what time do you start your day? Mm -hmm. 7 a.m., okay? Mm -hmm. Get up at 5 a.m. Yes. Try that for a change. Yes. Yes. Drag yourself out of bed. Yes. At 5 a.m., go down wherever, you, wherever your prayer time and your Bible study time is yes. and spend two hours. Try that and see, see how that works for you. Spend 30 minutes on your knees praying. And before you know it, praying for others, praying for your enemies, praying for someone that comes to your mind. 
you'll be 30 minutes into prayer and you won't even know it. And then get into the get into the word of God. Pray, God, open up my my enlighten my eyes of understanding. Speak to me. Give me fresh rhema from the word of God. And if you again, what did Jesus say when he was talking to people? And he said that if you ask anything in my name, God will give it to you. Yes. Our God is a good God, right? Yes. Hey, if you ask for a piece of bread, he's not going to throw you a scorpion, mm -hmm. right? So if you ask God to open my enlightenment, help me to understand scripture better, speak to me, show me things that I need to know. Do you think God is not going to do that? Mm -hmm. If you're sincere and you mean it in your heart, God is going to open up the doors and he's going to flood your soul your mind and your heart with the word of god and you know what's going to happen you're going to start to see things in a new light and you're going to become more zealous for the things of god see that's the problem and i'm going to say this and sounds critical okay but i'm a preacher and I'm a Bible teacher. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call black, black, and white, white. And to me, there's no really gray area. Okay? The problem with the majority of the body of Christ is they're too consumed with things in the world. And they make no or little time for the things of God. And then they wonder why they got all these problems. Nothing ever seems to go right. Am I speaking the truth? Okay. Make the time. And if your job is causing you not to have the time, okay, you got to find a way to make the time. It's just that simple. There's no excuses, okay? So let's do away with the excuses and let's just trust the Lord that he's going to do what he's, what he's telling us what uh, he needs to do. All right, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, from the dead and seated him at his right hand where he was originally, and then he left glory, came down to this earth, was put inside the Virgin Mary, was born of a man. This was known as the God-man, so he could go to the cross for all of us. You tell me another individual on the face of the earth that would go through all of that. Never. But God himself loves us that much that he would do that. Absolutely blows my mind. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. In every name that is named, not only in this age, but also that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is us, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all hallelujah can you say praise the lord amen 